My name is James McCann. I'm professor of history here at Boston University and also director of the African Studies Center. I'll be moderating our first session this morning, and we have three uh, papers, presentations to make. And since we have three and we've, we've agreed, I believe, that we will uh, confine ourselves to 15 to 20 minutes of presentation because we would like to engage with you, the, the audience. You'll notice, as was announced earlier, that there are microphones in the the central aisle, aisle here, and so we ask you to be generating further discussions of issues raised by our speaker just, just now. What I will do is to introduce our three speakers uh, around the topic that was organized by the, the conference organizers and suggest that while they may seem to be quite disparate, uh, I've in, enjoyed thinking through a little bit how I as moderator might make some sense of, uh, of the theme. The theme here uh, presented to us is From Farm to Fork, the global food chain. And before I introduce our speakers, I just want to add a few remarks um, to frame our discussions, because the discussions go from quite local. Those of us here in New England regard Hartford as a long way away um, on the southern edges of New England, but it is a local context. We also have a very global context in, in, in terms of um, international relations, thinking about global scale uh, ecology, as well as having uh, work done in a place like South Asia, the Indian subcontinent. My own work uh, spans thinking about from farm to, to fork. Uh, work I have done on the acceptance uh, and response to the, the crop of maize in Africa. Uh, over about 500 years. How farmers responded to that. To the most recent work I've done is on the history of African cuisine. And this, in this case, and I think in most, many parts of the world, the fork is not the proper F word. It would be fingers. By choice, people choose to engage the aesthetics of food by a more sensual way of, of delivering uh, the product of the farm to their to their mouth. So I will, far from being just the moderator, I've also looked forward to participating with my colleagues. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Helena Norberg Hodge is founder and director of the International Society for Ecology and Culture. She's been working for several de decades to strengthen local food economies and promote more sustainable and equitable patterns of living around, around the world. Her work is in South Asia, and I had to consult my, my map to find uh, Ladakh, but it is in a very key part of food production in, I will describe it as South Asia, but in that border area uh, in the northern part of, of India, not very far from Pakistan. Henrik Salim, my colleague, is assistant professor of international relations at Boston University. He conducts research and teaches classes on global and regional politics, and policy making on environment and sustainable development. We share students in common, and that's one of the ways that we break through some of those barriers about economists doing economics and not necessarily thinking about the wider implications of things. We work as colleagues together, leaping across the boundaries set up by our university, trying to make us avoid those connections, but we make them anyway. Mark Wynn is author of Closing the Food Gap, resetting the table in the land of plenty. For 25 years, Mark was, was the executive director of the Hartford, Hartford Food System. Again, the very local is part of our, of our mix here. And what's ironic, this is a, 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 the point I hadn't planned on making until I heard our esteemed speaker, the reason the French are buying Scottish water is because of the French celebration of the local. Is that not the ultimate irony? That having protected the locality of Camembert, and the varieties of wine uh, for the, the Burgundian uh, Pinot Noir and the, uh, the uh, Beaujolais and the Cabernet Sauvignon uh, are found in other parts of the country. That look, their love for the locality is what promotes this idea of trying to bring locality from another place at great expense for no seeming good reason. Of course, money being the, the major one. So we have th our three speakers today, and the format, because of the, the, the way the sound system is set up, is we'll, um, I will invite them to come and speak um, serially at the podium, and then we will re they will actually retire to the table. You see their names there, and we'll take questions and engage in a fuller discussion. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I was asked to talk a little bit about um, from farm to fork uh, with a specific focus uh, on the European Union. It is, after all, funded by my European brothers and sisters. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, agricultural policy in Europe and European Union uh, and some of the major issues that are being faced uh, there with respect to large scale and small scale farming and um, touch a little bit about some transatlantic uh, differences, uh, but I'm going to do it briefly and then um, you can ask whatever kind of questions you have afterwards. Now, of course, in Europe, as in any other parts uh, of the world, uh, agriculture and uh, agricultural policy is a very important sustainable development issue. It has a lot to do with economics, whether we like it or not. Uh, it has to do about figuring out what is the right price for food? What is the right price to pay a farmer? What is the right price for a consumer to buy whatever kind of food that consumer wants? Uh, within the European Union, it then also has to do with markets, opening up markets. Um, and that's true also in the United States, and that's also true globally, of course. But it's not just about economics. It also has very strong social and environmental dimensions to it, of course. Socially, it has to do uh, with the position of farming communities, rural communities. Uh, we have seen over the last 50 or so years in Europe and other places of the world migration to urban areas, but we're still sort of struggling to have well and, and, and living rural communities. Uh, in Europe, social aspects of agricultural policy are also very uh, closely linked to food safety issues. One of the great differences between the United States and the European Union on food issues has to do with GMOs, for instance. Um, and in Europe, GMOs is very much a food safety issue to a much higher degree than what it is in public discourse in this country. And environmental issues that are being touched upon is, of course, um, animal health and welfare, um, landscape management, it has to do with biodiversity, biodiversity protection, um, the use of fertilizers, the use of pesticide, and it all comes together in a big, great economic, social, environmental mesh that we somehow have to figure out what to do about. Now the main policy instrument, to talk a little bit about policy here, uh, for agriculture in the European Union is what is known as the Common Agricultural Policy, or the CAP for short, CAP, which has been uh, up and running in the European Union since uh, the early 1960s. And it's one of those policies that if you're a European, you either love it or hate it. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any kind of middle ground. Uh, those that are strong supporters of the Common Agricultural Policy I uh, like to point out that it's a key area of European collaboration. It's a key policy area within the European Union. It's one of those issues where uh, European countries and European citizens have collaborated the most over the last 50 years. Uh, food production uh, is also an important national issue in many countries, and it is an important regional issue. Uh, and it has to do with how much food you produce, where you produce it, how much should be imported, and so forth. And it's important to remember that one of the main early goals of the common agricultural policy in the 1960s was to produce more food, largely because there were still food shortages in many parts of Europe following World War II. They were rationing much longer in the UK and other European countries. Uh, now, of course, we are more in a position where we have food surplus, but that is a relatively recent issue uh, or uh, recent um, phenomenon. It used to be uh, that Europe was instead struggling from food shortages. Now, critics of the CAP like to point out uh, that it costs an awful lot of money, and most of that money goes to large-scale farming. There are very little of the common agricultural policy and the money within that policy that actually goes to small, local, organic farmers. It tend to go more to the agricultural, industrial complex, whatever that is. Uh, it also, because there's so much money, and I'm gonna get to how much money in, uh, in a second, uh, it has to do with subsidies, what you subsidize, um, distorting markets, and those kinds of things. Now, like many other things in Europe, the common agricultural policy, the way it was designed, was basically a compromise between Germany and France. 
Uh, Germany uh, wanted to have free movement of industrial goods, and France said, sure, we'd do that if you give us lots of money for our farmers. And they said, okay, we both get what we want, and we can just take it out of the common budget. Now, Europe, like the United States, is one of the most sort of industrial or post-industrial uh, regions uh, in the world. Of course, Europe depends on food, uh, but in economic terms, it does not depend on food production. Uh, food production is not generally an important uh, part of the national GDP. However, within the European Union, the budget, 35% goes to the common agricultural policy. Uh, and one of the shifts that have been over the last 10 or so years is moving money away from the common agricultural policy to what is vaguely known as rural development. And if you add up the money that had been spent on the common agricultural policy with the money that is spent on rural development, you get to about 45% of the EU budget. That's about 50 billion euros a year. Now, 45% of the budget, or 50 billion dollars a year, is spent on a sector that contributes about 1.6% to the GDP in the European Union. Now, you must agree that the farm lobby is quite effective, <laughs> right? If you can get close to 50% of the budgets spent on something that is less than 2% of GDP, you have figured out how to use the system. And of course, those countries that benefit mostly from the common agricultural policy are also the ones that resist changing the common agricultural policy. And by far, the biggest benefactor of the common agricultural policy was, of course, the country that designed it in the first place, France. Right? France alone gets about 20% of all money under the common agricultural policy. As in, France gets about 10 billion euros every year in subsidies from the European Union. Other countries are not far behind. France gets about 7 billion. Germany gets about 6 billion. So again, it's an awful lot of money we're talking about here. And almost all of that goes to supporting large-scale farming. As in, a lot of the money is basically tied to how much you produce. As in, the bigger farm you have, the more money you get. So the incentive is, of course, to go as large scale as you possibly can uh, because it reduces your production costs, but it also means you get much more subsidies from the European Union. So in, in fact, the entire system is geared towards supporting largely large scale farming in a relatively small amount of countries. So those countries that do not benefit as much from the common agricultural policy is, of course, trying to uh, change this as much as they possibly can, but they're running into very strong national interests, uh, not just in France, it's easy to pick on France when it comes to the common agricultural policy, uh, but other countries like Spain, Italy, Poland, as in largely the major European countries are generally happy with the way it is. One exception is, of course, the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom is trying to change this uh, system uh, every time there is a budget negotiations, and they basically lose every single time. Now, if you, that was in total amounts of money. If you actually do it per capita, it's slightly different than Greece and, and, and Ireland is at, at top. But also, those countries that are then the largest receivers of money are also the largest producer of food within the European Union. But again, it, it's, it's, it's a system focused on producing or supporting large-scale farming systems that are probably not the most sustainable farming systems in the world. In fact, they're not. And another big debate in the European Union when it comes to uh, farming and agricultural policy is that one of the ways uh, that European countries and the European Union have traditionally supported national farmers, it not, it's not just by giving them lots of money for large-scale farming, but also by erecting various barriers to trade uh, to farmers outside the European Union. So what the European Union does in terms of agricultural subsidies similar to what happens in the United States, will have large ramifications for outside the European Union. 
It has important implications for food production in Africa, Latin America, countries just outside the borders of the European Union. Uh, because as the European Union went from food shortages to food surpluses, the question was, okay, we have more food than we need in the European Union, what do we do? Well, we subsidize it for export, of course. We get rid of it, and our farmers benefit. Well, if you're a French farmer or a German farmer, that might be good news for you. If you're a farmer in Tanzania or Ethiopia or Brazil, it's not as good news for you because European farm practices basically manage to keep prices relatively high in Europe and press global prices down. So many small-scale farmers around the world, I think, have a very good reason to be relatively disappointed in EU agricultural policy over the last 30 or 40 years. And one final thing uh, before I hand it over to our, to our next speaker. Uh, there are also big differences within the European Union when it comes to GMO and GMO crops. <coughs> On average, it's probably fair to say that Europeans are more resistant uh, to GMOs than Americans, but it is also important to remember that there are big differences within the 27 members of the European Union. Not all European countries have the same policy and the same attitude towards GMOs. There are definitely those countries that are much closer to the uh, US position, and then there are those that are uh, much more skeptical. So I, I just want to caution you a little bit to just generally uh, sweeping arguments that GMOs is not accepted in Europe while they're accepted in the United States. It's a little <laughs> bit more complicated than that. Um, and I would be happy to talk more about that. But I think uh, in giving everyone an opportunity to speak and also have more questions afterwards. I will pass the baton. Thank you and good morning. And it's Mark Winnie. It's all right. It's like the bear, like Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, you all know Winnie the Pooh. Right. Hands across the ocean. Winnie the Pooh and A.A. A. Milne. Okay. So. Uh, I think I was, uh, I was grateful to hear uh, Satir speak of gratitude. I think of Shakespeare who said that our greatest sin is ingratitude. And I, uh, again, reaching across the ocean to try to embrace other literary figures, I, uh, I, I think of that often. And in fact, I'm great, grateful for the spiritual connection and, and of, um, sense you brought, sensibility you brought to us this morning, for as I think we all know, God did not create nachos. <laughs> right. So I think we need to have a more spiritual bent toward our food. So thank you to Boston University for having me and, for, uh, and the Institute for Human Sciences and the Center for International Relations. This sounds like a great day. I'm, I'm really happy to participate to be a part of something this, this uh, solid, this focused, and, and so incredibly relevant to what's going on today. Um, I apologize for not joining you last night to sample some of the authentic pleasures that uh, uh, Bryant Terry no doubt stirred up, um, but I uh, succumbed to my baser instincts, I suppose, my darker side, and went to Fenway Park uh, to <laughs> indulge my, uh, my love affair with the Boston Red Sox. And uh, two Fenway Franks later, and uh, one giant pretzel and two beers, I was regretting that choice. <laughs> but it was fun anyway. Um, my take on the topic of the day, uh, which is really, I want to look at the influence of agribusiness and food politics. And I'm coming at it from the perspective, perspective of its impact on lower income communities in the United States, uh, where we have significant food gaps. And those gaps include food insecurity. About 12% of Americans are considered food insecure by the United States Department of Agriculture. We have what are called food deserts, places that are severely underserved by high quality, affordable, uh, food stores that provide nutritious, healthful food. As a result, high, high rates of obesity, overweight, and diet-related illnesses, such as diabetes. 
And this is the kind of system that we have in this, in this country. Uh, these are the conditions that we find in lower income communities compared, of course, to a whole other set of trends, which are the immense growth and interest in organic and locally produced food, connections and interest in the, uh, in the health and dietary uh, importance of food. So uh, we have two very different food systems operating in this country. Now, I like to start off with the particulars. I like to start with experience and build on that. So I'm going to just share a paragraph or two from my book, Closing the Food Gap, <clears throat> as a way to set the stage for the connection between agribusiness <clears throat> and food politics and what is going on in our nation's food system. Having worked in low-income communities for 35 years, I often feel the kind of frustration I experienced late one night in Hartford, Connecticut, as I stood behind a young, very pregnant mother and her overweight child as she was purchasing cigarettes, Pepsi, candy, potato chips, and nothing else. I had to wrestle down my urge to rip those things from her hands and admonish her for all the terrible things she was doing to her body, her unborn child, her un rather her unborn baby, and her child. My liberal tolerance for self-destructive behavior has been tested on many occasions, and I have tried to avoid glib excuses, pat explanations, and the relativistic arguments of the politically correct. After taking a deep breath, I have tried to reflect quietly on encounters with irresponsible behavior to better understand the relationship between an individual's circumstances, his or her personal frailties, and a host of environmental influences. And the more I have done this, the more convinced I have become that yes, diet-related health problems, one huge portion of the food gap, can be controlled by personal behavior, but that the social, political, and economic forces bearing down on the most vulnerable are so powerful that it would take an abnormally strong and discerning person to overcome them. So that's the stage on which I have worked for my entire professional life. And I've always tried to figure out what is going on here. What are the forces that are acting on this mother in Hartford, Connecticut, that night buying food that is going to damage her body and the, as well as the bodies of her children. And um, in short, I come down at, on it this way. I look at the failures of our marketplace to serve everybody equally, to provide affordable, healthy food to all, regardless of income, of residency, of race, and also the role that public policy has played in supporting the failure of our marketplace to serve all. Our mother lives in a food desert, a place that uh, has been abandoned by the supermarket industry. I witnessed the wholesale abandonment of urban America during my tenure in Hartford, uh, a city that is poor, actually, uh, the second poorest city in the country, uh, based on the percentage of people living below the poverty level. But just like many cities across the country, it was a completely abandoned by the supermarket industry, leaving behind the most vulnerable, the poorest, the people with the least means, and often the least education and least information about food. The impacts of this, of this abandonment and of, of, of food deserts have been well documented by uh, researchers such as Kim, uh, Dr. Kimberly Moreland, who has found a direct connection between the lack of consumption of healthy food and the distance that one must go to get to a supermarket, and that those distances are greater for communities of color and for low-income communities as well. And as we know, the obesity rates and diabetes rates, hypertension, and other dietary-related illnesses are higher in lower-income communities. In Washington, D.C., in the 8th Ward of, that, of our nation's capital, only a mile from the Capitol building itself, we find a classic food desert. 70,000 people live in the 8th Ward. But out of that number, 38% are, li are living below the poverty level. 38% are also obese. If you drive around the 8th Ward, at least until the last few months, 
uh, you would not find a place you could buy any kind of healthy food. And yes, you will find every kind of fast food place available. Uh, Mac, you know, Mac Burger and uh, uh, Taco Hut and all the, uh, all the fast food places are there in abundance, but not, nothing healthy. You find the same condition in rural America, too. I, uh, I, I moved about five years ago to New Mexico and have done a fair amount of research and writing on the conditions of uh, food insecurity and uh, food deserts in uh, rural areas in New Mexico. In one county, uh, I found that 72% of the population is overweight or obese. When you look at the numbers for the children in the WIC program, Women, Infant, and Children, and children Program, Federal Food Assistance Program, uh, we found that um, um, about, uh, see, I think it's, the number is about 35% of the children in that program in these poor uh, rural counties were obese. And that, those are children two to five years old. 35% are obese. And there's a direct connection, again, with the fact that there are no places to buy healthy food in those rural areas. Now, the food industry frames this problem in a really interesting way. In short, they blame the victim. And um, they blame this mother for irresponsible behavior, for not being able to feed herself well, for not using her own knowledge, her own skills, supposedly. Well, there's some interesting, interesting paper that recently came out uh, by uh, Kelly Bernal from uh, Yale and uh, colleague Kenneth Warner, where he compared the framing techniques and communication style and political activities of big tobacco, which as we all know has killed millions and millions of people, and big food. That in fact he argues that big food, our, our uh, you know, fast food industry, our, all the unhealthy food products that are put out in the United States, or across the globe I'm sure, um, they use the same, same techniques that big, uh, that big tobacco used to defend tobacco for so long. For instance, they focus on personal responsibility as the cause of the nation's unhealthy diet. They raise fears that government action usurps personal freedom. They vilify critics with totalitarian language, characterizing them as the food police, leaders of a nanny state, or even food fascists. They criticize studies that hurt the food industry as junk science. They emphasize physical activity over diet. They state that there are no good or bad foods, hence no food or food type should be targeted for change. And they plant doubt when concerns are raised about the industry. This is what big food does, is the same game plan as big tobacco. I saw this in action many times uh, in state legislatures across the country where I've done a lot of work, a lot of advocacy work to try to bring healthier food in, in, in particular to our nation's schools. Uh, many state legislatures have tried to bring some order and some sanity to the kind of food that is served in our, in our uh, cafeterias. In uh, Connecticut, in, uh, about three or four years ago, Advocates brought forward a leg legislation to ban the sale or the availability of soda in the state's public schools. It passed the legislature by overwhelming majorities, both houses of the legislature. In fact, it was the one bill that was debated longer than any other bill during that session of the legislature. And that was a year when the legislature was, de was debating civil unions and the death penalty and they actually debated uh, banning soda longer than anything else. Even after, however, the, uh, had, this bill had passed by such large majorities, the, uh, both Pepsi and Coca-Cola rallied their troops and were able to convince the governor to veto the bill. And uh, they did it by amassing a war chest of $140,000 to buy the best and most connected and most powerful lobbyists in the state. And the only, only use of that money was to secure that gubernatorial veto. I've seen the same kind of behavior in state after state, including my new home state of New Mexico, where people have, uh, citizens have cried out for changes in food, but have had to fight tooth and nail 
with the soda industry or the junk food industry to keep that kind of food out of, our, out of the mouths of our children. But this has been aided and abetted, indirectly anyway, by our own governmental policies. Our child nutrition program, which provides reimbursement to our schools to provide school breakfast, lunch, and other nutrition programs, is woefully underfunded. As a result, food service directors are forced to buy the cheapest food possible. And oftentimes, they're forced to use pizza and soda and hot dogs as uh, fundraising tools to try to raise enough money to meet their expenses. The federal reimbursement currently for the food portion of our school meals is $1 per child per meal. Now, I was recently at my own my, uh, alma mater, Bates College, which is up in Maine, and uh, they are, uh, like uh, many colleges and universities across the country, changing their dining programs to emphasize sustainable uh, foods, um, sustainably produced foods, a sustainable cafeteria, uh, sourcing their food locally, uh, going in every way possible for healthy food. And they are spending $2.60 per meal in comparison to what we are spending in our, our public schools, which is $1 per meal. That kind of gives you a sense of what the gap is there in the way that we regard food. Gratefully, at the higher levels of education, we're seeing a change, but that change has not yet taken place uh, at, at, uh, you know, in our schools. Our, our children have to continually fight day and night, our parents have to fight day and night, and advocates have to fight day and night to make sure that children have healthy food. Um, as the poet Wallace Stevens once said, everyone takes sides in social change if it's profound enough, and you can bet the food industry is taking sides. I was recently in Austin, Texas, where I was doing some research for another book. And I visited with a group called the Sustainable Food Center. They run a wonderful program called Happy Kitchen, Cochina Alegra, which um, runs food uh, education programs for mostly lower income people, mostly women, uh, mostly Mexican, and has remar a remarkable impact on the people uh, who participate in the program. And I interviewed several Mexican women during the course of my research, all who told me that as soon as they came for, to the United States from Mexico, they gained about 30 pounds. Within one to two months, 30 pounds, because they, their diet was Americanized. You know, they found themselves going to McDonald's, uh, eating more meat. Um, and and also sort of confronting their own ignorance about food and what their choices might be. By participating in Cochina Alegra, they were able to actually lose 30 pounds over the course of that six-week program. So yet this program, as effective as it is, only receives enough money to, to work with about oh, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 people per year. And there are tens of thousands of people in the central Texas area alone that could benefit from this program. If our mother in Hartford on that evening had access to such a program, I dare say she would not be uh, as likely to engage in the purchases that she was making at that time. In fact, the people I met were empowered by the information they had. They were empowered by the education they were receiving in, this, in Cochina Alegra. Not only were they empowered in terms of changing their lives, they were starting to act more uh, aggressively as food citizens, taking on, taking on activities such as trying to change the quality of school food in their own, in their own uh, public schools. Now, of course, our mother in Hartford is also influenced by poverty, which itself is a dilemma in more ways than one. Our U.S. social welfare system places unbelievable weight on nutrition assistance. We put, up, we put up $75 billion a year now, a number that is growing in the economy, for food assistance. 15 separate U.S. Department of Agriculture food, food assistance programs are operated around the United States. And yet it hasn't effectively reduced hunger and food insecurity. It manages poverty, in effect, by making sure that people eat, that they don't starve, 
but it does nothing to try to eliminate the cause of hunger and food insecurity, which is poverty. I'll give you one example. I was visiting with a, uh, a food stamp director in a, a county in New Mexico. He runs the county food stamp office. And he was perplexed by the fact that he was seeing a huge increase in the number of people coming into his office applying for food stamps. He was perplexed because the um, unemployment rate in that county was only about 1 or 2 percent. Well, the reason it was only 1 or 2 percent was that the largest employers in that county were Walmart stores. One Walmart, one regular Walmart, and a large regional distribution center. The wages at that Walmart were so low that all of, almost all of their employees were eligible for the food stamp program. The food stamp program, in effect, um, our taxpayer dollars, if you're a U.S. citizen, are uh, subsidizing Walmart by, because we, they simply don't pay people enough to be able to eat. You know, Henry Ford, for uh, all his uh, flaws, at least paid his workers enough so that they could afford the cars they were producing. Why can't we, as a nation, pay people enough so that they can eat? Now, along with, along with this, and I've, I've written about this, and I'm, I, I, still, I still, in fact, am concerned by the fact that our, public our, our private charities, our charitable food system, has at least indirectly aided and abetted our, our, um, our uh, troubled food system, our failed marketplace, and our public policies, which are not focused well on trying to uh, address the causes of our, of our of food insecurity, obesity, and so forth. Food banking is perhaps something we now take for granted in this country. About one in 10 Americans will use a food bank at least once during the course of a year. Yet, I go back far enough in my work when there were no food banks, when there were only a handful of, um, of emergency food sites, and they were usually the old mission organizations like the Salvation Army, where somebody could go and get some assistance, food assistance. And it was only in, a very, in the case of a very distinct emergency. Now they are commonplace. Over 200 national or, or uh, local food banks, large uh, warehouses, which are tens of thousands of square feet in size, over 60,000 separate sites in the United States today where somebody can get emergency food. Over 60,000. When I started up in the, in the late 1970s, we only had three or four such places in the city of Hartford. There weren't more than, I'm sure, a couple of thousand around the country. Today, they've become the norm, the place where, low, where, where poor people go and get food. I think we have to examine this norm and question whether or not that we as a nation should be feeding our people in this way and begin to mobilize that, that concern, that charitable response, that kind of generosity in a way that can be more effective in changing the system and changing public policy. And of course, we need to hold our federal policymakers accountable. You know, this is really, I guess, in a way, the root of the problem. We've heard a lot from others, um, you know, Michael Pollan in particular, about how our federal farm policies undermine our health and promote a food, a food and farming system which is dangerous, uh, which is, you know, supports the industrial food system. It, I was fascinated to hear the, the European situation sounds almost exactly as the same as the U.S. situation, you know, where we, even in as much energy as advocates brought a year or two ago to the changing the farm bill, which was passed in 2007, 2008, uh, we still were not able to make a significant dent in reducing those subsidies for large-scale commodity producers. We still only put a very small percentage of our agricultural funding into uh, fruits and vegetables, for instance, uh, smaller-scale farming, organic and sustainable uh, food production. Um, we did make some gains this past year, um, and we are doing more to support the development of small scale and, and, and local. We're, we are seeing more fruits and vegetables showing up in our schools, but it takes a tremendous amount of effort on the part of advocates in order for this to occur. 
We've seen such programs as Farm to School, which are connecting local schools to, agri to local farms. A very logical thing. I don't know why we haven't been doing it all along, but you know, it didn't fit our industrial model of purchasing food and consuming food. But now we, are, we actually have over 9,000 schools. About 10% of our schools in the United States are sourcing at least some of their food from local farmers. And we're getting some support now for that out of the federal system. Such small programs as the Farmers Market Nutrition Program provide assistance to low-income families to buy food at farmers markets. This is only funded at a minuscule level compared to, say, food stamps, but at least it, is, it has played a significant role in fueling the development of farmers markets in the United States. We have close to 5,000 farmers markets, perhaps by the peak of this growing season. I'm sure we will have 5,000 farmers markets in the United States. We also have community-supported agriculture farms, which are making connections between everybody in the community, regardless of income, and locally produced, organically produced food. And to some extent, these programs, the farmers markets, community supported agriculture, are being supported by good public policy, sometimes at the local and state levels, sometimes at the federal levels as well. So food justice, which is what I, I and my colleagues call that effort to try to bring the best food to everybody, is being supported by both our, system of, our systems of charity, our systems of public policy, and just by good, local, caring, compassionate people doing good work at the local level. So I think that that is, um, you know, I, just in, to summarize, I do think that we have to find, continue to support both these, these, these uh, local efforts like the, like the Sustainable Food Center by the Cochina Allegra, community-supported agriculture that is reaching out and, and bringing everybody into the community, into that, into that farm system so that they can eat uh, good local food just the way that well-educated, uh, high-income people are eating. Um, I also think that we need to focus a lot of our policy attention on uh, local and state efforts as well. We ha now have in North America over 100 food policy councils. These are operating at local and state levels and are beginning to mobilize the, the activity and the, the uh, policy apparatus of, of local and, and state government to focus on systems that are, are sustainable and just. And I think we need to support the development of those food policy councils. There are, of course, many, many other examples. I think that that's sufficient for now. But I look forward to your questions, and I look forward to talking to you during the course of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thanks to Elizabeth for organizing a conference like this, which I think is immensely important, particularly because it's trying to look at the issue from an international perspective. I've been looking at this issue from a very international perspective for 35 years now. And the problem with looking at it as internationally as I do is that it sounds, what I have to say, sounds very general and therefore often superficial. But I am speaking from experience, uh, grassroots experience. It's quite unusual, I think, that there are organizations like mine with uh, associates and actually branches in many different countries and our materials have been translated into 50 languages. And so we've been working with groups around the world in both North and South now for, for 35 years. And so, as I say, I think it's very, very important that we do look at it from this broader international point of view, because then a pattern emerges that I think can help us find ways to support this localization of food systems, which I see as the structural shift that we need to make globally um, through international collaboration and through pressure at the level of, of trade, at the deregulation of trade is really the central, most uh, strategic area, I believe, that we need to focus on in order to turn things around. That can often seem a bit overwhelming and a bit difficult to deal with for many people. 
But I believe if we could do, um, as, as you were saying, um, support these local initiatives while we devote some of our time to look at policy, that we could make huge strides relatively rapidly. Because basically, big food, as we were hearing, is very similar to big tobacco. It's also very similar to big oil and to toxic debt and financial speculation. The speculative bubble has burst. We've been exposed to the fact that this was based on, on trading toxic debt. Trading in toxic debt, speculating on increasing insecurity and debt worldwide. If we look at what the structural problem was there, we, we're already hearing that it was to do with the deregulation of finance. The deregulation of finance means removing rules that were protecting society and the environment. And now I feel the next step is to have this real wake up that the food crisis that's coming our way is structurally based on the same problem of deregulated finance and trade. In deregulating finance and trade, what countries are doing is allowing, not only allowing, but forcing big food to get bigger. What is being created is a global arena where the McDonald's and the Walmarts can move in and out of every economy freely free and independent. In the meanwhile, what we're witnessing worldwide is that the local, regional, and even national players are being more and more tightly regulated. While those that are big enough to move around and blackmail governments by saying, if you don't give me that infrastructure, if you don't give me that cheap labor, if you don't remove some of those nasty environmental constraints, I won't come to you. Right now, there are something like 500 SEZs in India. SEZs are, are special economic zones. And what they mean is that companies can come in and do as they please. That's what these special zones are. And of course, they exist in China as well. So I hope that all of you will be interested in this rather abstract and general and sometimes seemingly overpowering issue of the global um, plays, um, what's being played out globally. I, I want to also stress that this afternoon we're going to talk about solutions and I personally feel so encouraged and so empowered by a growing faith in human nature. Something else that big companies are undermining all the time by putting the blame on the individual, putting the blame essentially on human <coughs> nature, when in actual fact I think what we need to look at is an inhuman scale, that scale is fundamental to our problems, and that the scale demands a specialization that inevitably leads to blindness. And again, when I think looking at the bigger pattern, having a, a systems theory of the global economy's impact on culture and agriculture, and with that systems theory, what I'll be talking about more this afternoon is the systemic shift towards localizing that I believe can solve not only these mammoth and growing food problems and farm, farming problems, but also the human crisis. We have now, as a consequence of the economies. Uh, interaction with society and with agriculture, we are seeing worldwide an epidemic of depression, particularly in the industrialized countries, and epidemics of violence, of fundamentalism, ethnic friction. And in my experience and analysis, the culprit is this inhuman economic juggernaut I want to say a little bit about how I arrived at these ideas, what made me start looking at it from this global point of view. 
I was asked in 1975 to go out to a part of the world that I had never heard of, and many of you may not have heard of it. It's a place called Ladakh, and it's actually the westernmost part of Tibet. And in this part of Tibet, which belonged to India, uh, there was a thriving culture that had been isolated from the rest of the world, that had in no significant way been affected by either uh, Christianity, slavery, colonialism, or even modern-day development. Because from the Second World War until 1974, it was sealed off from the outside world for political reasons. Because this part of Tibet that belonged politically to India was being surrounded by Indian army, and it was considered a very sensitive border area, so no one was allowed up there. So when I arrived there, in 1975, just really a few months after people had been allowed in there, I found a culture that had evolved according to its own principles, a population that had adapted to an extremely difficult environment, high altitude desert, and I found a wealth that was astounding compared to my experience of so-called less developed parts of the world, and I had traveled fairly widely, I found in Ladakh a level of wealth that was astounding. Um, in this barren desert, through a careful adaptation and a careful use of resources, people had acquired enough to have stores of grain, primarily barley, but also wheat, uh, for several years. They had jewelry like these turquoises and corals and pearls that had been traded from far afield, from across the world. And most importantly, I found a people who were more joyous and vital than any people I had encountered anywhere in the world. I became totally fascinated. I'd come out as part of a film team. I was supposed to just stay for six weeks. But I became so fascinated by these people and their culture, that I decided to stay on to do a thesis on the language. It gave me an excuse to stay in this fabulous place. And learning to speak the language fluently, relatively rapidly, gave me an insight into the psychological ways that the global economy, with its global consumer monoculture, affects diverse cultures around the world. So I think that Elizabeth has asked me to talk particularly about the cultural dimension. And um, what, what I think we have to, uh, again, from this global point of view, recognize is that the term culture is really a word that describes the diverse relationships that people had established between a group of people and the natural world. In other words, cultures as we know them, the diversity of cultures that we see around the world, emanated from a deep dialogue between humans and nature. What we have in the modern era is quite something else. We are now witnessing the shaping of culture essentially by corporate uh, giants. We are seeing the spread of a of a consumer monoculture, as I said, that's being disseminated through media and through the seduction, particularly of children. Um, now, fundamental to the creation of this consumer culture is the systematic breakdown of those traditional relationships, those more local relationships between people and their resources. And fundamental to that is farming is the way in which people around the world uh, gain their primary, most important product, what we eat. Every day, about three times a day, we eat. There could be nothing more fundamental to our economic activity than the production of that. Nothing, nothing else that humans produce do we need to co consume every day of the year, roughly three times a day. And yet, with this global monoculture, what's happening is a systematic distancing between people and the source of their food. So the distance from the farm to the fork 
is systematically growing longer and longer as the intermediaries, those that separate production from consumption, the giant corporations are becoming bigger and bigger. And I'm sure someone has mentioned already, or if they haven't, it, it, we need to remind ourselves that these giant corporations have been increasing profits dramatically while hunger has been growing, as you know, dramatically over the last few years. So these giant intermediaries, which by the way, I believe it's vitally important that we don't demonize the people who work in those corporations or even demonize the corporations. I think it's really important that we look at the structures, at this issue of scale, the issue of specialization, scale, and how global trade is taking us very rapidly in the wrong direction. So anyway, in this distancing between people and their source of food, you have at the same time a psychological pressure that is having a profound effect on young children worldwide, including in the US. But I first became aware of it out there on the other side of the world, in, in, on the Tibetan plateau. When I first arrived, as I mentioned, these people were among the happiest, most vital people I had ever encountered. They were also among the most dignif dignified and uh, I came to realize deeply self-respecting. But I saw how in a relatively short period this changed, particularly because media and superficial ideas gleaned through tourism, um, advertising and media primarily led to a completely unrealistic um, sort of romanticized view of what the West is like. People started thinking that in the West we basically lead a life of leisure and luxury, almost infinite wealth. We do almost no work. These perceptions had a very profound effect on young children who started thinking that their parents who wanted them to work in the field and get dirty were asking them to do this totally anachronistic, backward, primitive, um, you know, pursue a lifestyle that was completely meaningless in the modern era. The imagery and furthered by modern day schooling, the message was the future is urban the future is moving into the city and joining that modern, incredibly wealthy uh, and superior lifestyle. I saw how in a short time children, for psychological reasons, started rejecting everything to do with their own culture, especially their food, but, but clothing, language, music, architecture, every aspect of their culture came to be seen as inferior. And out of a psychological desire, there was this need to imitate uh, the West. So you started having, uh, you know, cement boxes instead of the beautiful adobe mud brick architecture that had stood the test of time for thousands of years. You started seeing this desperate desire to have the running shoes, to have the, the Nikes, to have all the attributes of this modern superior culture. And for young children, it was considered uh, you know, a step forward to be eating white imported bread instead of their own local stone ground organic whole wheat bread. I discovered that this in Ladakh led in a relatively short period to young people starting to use a dangerous skin lightening cream called Fair and Lovely. I worked in Bhutan over a five year period and saw exactly the same story played out there. And as I mentioned, our materials, I wrote a book about this called Ancient Futures. Uh, and that book has been translated along with a film that we made between the two into almost 50 languages. And so we've had the report from culture after culture, Laos, Burma, especially in Asia, but also South America, 
regions of Africa, where people again and again tell us that this story of Ladakh is our story too, only the problems in many cases started much earlier. So there is a global picture here that is very, very uh, sad and where one sees, I think, more clearly the key elements we need to focus on. There is also a global story of, of Cucinas Alegras, as we heard about. There is a global story of people working to rebuild that fabric of local connection. And it's very, very encouraging. It's a testimony to human goodwill, to human perseverance. And yet, what I find everywhere, even in my native country of Sweden and in the rest of Scandinavia, the governments are moving with the global capital, with the big oil, the big food, and the big tobacco. They're moving with that and separating themselves from their voting public. And I believe that as long as we remain economically illiterate, as long as we do not articulate clearly the need to say no to the deregulation of trade as well as finance, say yes to a re-regulation of global trade and finance, until that 10% of the population that's already involved in local food, when that 10% starts articulating and clearly spelling out what kind of policy changes we need, I think we could see very rapid change in what is clearly a healthier and more sustainable direction. I think I have a couple of more minutes, do I? Yeah? I, 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 I just want to say that um, in terms of the distancing, that there are th factors here that it, it drives me almost mad, um, maybe it shows already, <laughs> that there isn't enough of a discussion of these issues. Already 25 years ago, I was raising awareness about the fact that potatoes were being shipped from Sweden to Italy to be washed and put in plastic bags and then shipped back again. Today, that was by road. It was insane 25 years ago. The insanity has now escalated into something that is quite normal, but we don't hear about it as we talk about global warming and CO2 emissions. Now you have supermarkets flying apples from the UK to South Africa to be washed and waxed and flying them back again. And then they're sold as UK apples. This is going on in larger and larger quantities. You have fish flown from Norway to China to be deboned and flown back again. Scampi sent to Thailand to be peeled and flown back again. And there is a huge amount of money now from the big food industry to try to tell us that local doesn't actually reduce energy consumption. Apparently, I'm told, in this issue of Mother Jones magazine, they're talking about how but when you buy at a farmer's market, you've got all those trucks coming in from all those individual farmers, whereas if you buy at the supermarket, there's only one truck as though there was this giant farm over here producing everything the supermarket needs. No, the supermarket economy is structurally linked to bigger and bigger monocultures in more and more distant areas. And countries are routinely importing and exporting identical products. When we last did the statistics about five, six years ago, the US was exporting about 900,000 tons of beef and veal. And guess how much they were importing? About 900,000 tons of beef and veal. This is happening routinely. UK exports in butter and milk, roughly the same as the imports. And around the world, farmers are told, we're getting all these imports because they're more efficient over there. Another thing that's happening is that food from 10,000 miles away will routinely cost less than food from a mile away. And I just, I just finished with this example, these examples that I started studying this uh, in terms of butter as I was um, in touch with these various community groups around the world. And I found that in Mongolia, where 
They have 25 million milk producing animals and you couldn't ever uh, run out of dairy. In Ulaanbaatar, you couldn't even find Mongolian butter or dairy. It was from Germany. In Nairobi, I found Dutch butter costing half as much as Kenyan butter. In Spain, where my husband and I lived for many years, Danish and Dutch butter cost roughly half as much as Spanish butter. And in Denmark, I was served French butter in little plastic pots. And in France, they were selling Danish butter. In Devon, New Zealand butter cost a third of the price of the butter from the farm down the road. Now this pattern of structurally destroying the access to local food, in other words, making it expensive and then calling it elitist, is born of hidden subsidies as well as the over-regulation of the local and the deregulation of the global. So I think by looking at subsidies and, and the regulatory framework, we can turn things around in a very effective way. Thank you. Thank you. I think Helena brought us very effectively full circle back to supermarkets and to butter. Um, indicative of the kinds of issues that, that, that relate all of these. So as uh, those of you who have questions come to the microphones, uh, I'd also uh, want to have the, uh, the speakers think about questions that they would like to raise with one another. But we do have a question, a couple of them here I can't see very well. OK, yes, in the back. Um, yeah, I, I'm a community health nurse, and um, I volunteered in Katrina. Uh, my joke is, is that I got my training in a third world country. That third world country is called Roxbury, Mattapan, Dorchester, where I worked. And uh, it served me quite well. Actually, I did street medicine work with homeless. Um, when I would ride the number one bus down Mass Ave, and people in Boston know this, you get out at Boston Medical Center, all the Caucasians get off. And so I would call it going to the plantation, OK? So I want to talk about the inner city plantation in Boston just for a second. I use the term plantation in both meanings, that that community is completely segregated off. At the same time, when slaves came to America, so here they are in this country, they don't know the plants. But they, I'm an herbalist also. They used the root of the cotton plant to abort slave owners' children, OK? The reason I'm bringing that up is I would have Bayesian patients. I would have Haitian patients, Cambodian patients, Tibetan patients. And you say to them, what are you taking for your hypertension? They're all importing herbs, folks. They're all pirating herbs. There's a huge amount of wisdom there about food. I'd come out and tell the doctor they're doing herbals along with the med, which the doctor would ignore because it was too much to deal with the interaction, OK? Why am I going on about this? Look at this room. Where's the people here? Where's the panel here? Where are my peeps? My peeps aren't here, and that wisdom is still there to draw on. And until we do, we're screwed. the panelists want to comment? Well, I, I, yes, I, I would like to comment. I, I helped to build up an alliance of women in Ladakh that now has about 8,000 women who have a lot of that wisdom. They don't speak English. And when they do, they usually don't have that wisdom anymore because the modern education system is robbing people of that. So there is this structural problem that very often that wisdom is contained in ways that are very, very hard to harness. And I think, I think we also need to recognize that there are a lot of white Western men, you know, that in this spectrum of things can be like the boogeyman, that are striving to help bring back ways of living and doing things that really would support the flourishing of that wisdom. So I think we should try to stay away from a politics of identity and look at the issues more and try to see on whose side we're working. But I understand your frustration. I'm saying it needs to be a two-way street. I'm not making anybody an enemy. 
But as long as we sit here and we say, oh, those poor victims, we can't draw on their wisdom, and it is still there. It is still there in generations. I've spoken to teenagers who know about bark from trees. Michelle Obama, she's doing a garden. That's Southern. That's her Southern roots. Thank you. Uh, let's have uh, down here, and then we'll move back up. Above. Regarding, uh, you're talking about uh, production and uh, farming production that goes global, uh, but you didn't touch at all about the farmers. I mean, because I came from a country, kind of an island, that the farmers were uh, uh, incentivized to produce more to send it to make money. So uh, none of you touched about the farmers because the, the, uh, all farmers everywhere are incentivized to produce much more than, than the local uh, uh, consumption. So how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, I would say that, the, that yes, worldwide farmers are being subsidized to grow monocrops for long distance markets. And again, it's interesting, you see, it's longer and longer distances. It's not always for the global market. But this distancing is structurally linked to monoculture. And the monoculture is devastating for the land. And it's the same in fisheries and forestry, all primary production, basically. So the diversification is linked, structurally linked, to shortening the distances. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't understand and haven't thought about. And I think if more people pressure for policy change, we might be able to, to reverse this. But the distancing is what allows the middlemen to get the upper hand and to then to blackmail you know, producers against consumers and to pressure our governments. So. We need very, very, at the moment, we don't need to remove all ag subsidies. We need to shift the subsidies. Um, but what we hear about in the media is a very, very shallow uh, you know, notion that the subsidies are all bad. Um, but worldwide, they are being pressured to grow monocrops, and they're being pressured to use more and more technology instead of employing people. So more and more fossil fuels technology, fewer and fewer farmers. So we have this mega uh, migration into megalopolises. Beijing right now is basically 60 million people, 20 in the center and 18 satellite cities of about 2 million. It's a complete disaster. The urbanization is a consequence of policies, a consequence of what our governments and corporations are funding. And we really... If I could also just say that right now we have roughly half the global population on the land, still, roughly. It's shrinking every day. And that issue is a really a millennial and vitally important issue that we look at. How we can rebalance the relationship between urban and rural. It's not a question of eliminating urbanization, but it's a question of realizing that we are headed towards this mega industrialization and urbanization that's just a disaster. Are there comments from either on these? I was just going to questions? add that both uh, Henrik and I talked about our, our respective uh, agricultural policies and how they obviously favor the industrial food system, large-scale producers, commodity producers. Uh, we overproduce and farmers are, can grow whatever, well, they can grow within those five categories of commodities, grow as much as they want and pretty much guaranteed a price. I think the only way that's going to change is through political action, uh, starting at, at local and state levels. Uh, organized groups are going to uh, once again have to uh, you know, assault the barriers when those policies come up again for review. But how, how, do, how do you going to make a can, 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 can we uh, get some of the other questions on the table and then have, uh, have the responses incorporate? The, the incentives will have to shift. They will have to shift so that, smaller, that, so that a different kind of agriculture can be promoted, one that is based on health and the, and the food needs of the nation, not on... Yeah, you know, the handful, the needs of a handful of, of small, of, of a small number of commodity producers. Yeah. No, th these are qu questions that I think the, the, the panel can consider, and they will accumulate as we go along. We're panel number one, so we want to show some good discipline. So in, in the back, and then we'll come forward again. I guess that's me. Yes. My name is Molly Anderson, and I hope that other people who ask questions through the day will introduce themselves, especially since we don't. 
uh, have name tags. My question is mainly for Mark, and it actually uh, follows up on the previous question, and hopefully we'll um, explore some other aspects of it. Other speakers may have uh, viewpoints on it too. I'm especially interested in the right to food and its potential as a, a mobilizing tool, a mobilizing construct for people to start shifting what we demand of our government in public policy and in accountability, and also shifting uh, what we ask of international corporations in accountability to the people from whom they are deriving their profits. Mark, I know you travel around a lot. You have talked to people about um, food policy councils, both at the local level and the state level, and I'm interested in whether this discourse about right to food is emerging in the United States and if so, what specific policies people are asking for or thinking about? People in Boston, who I work with, with the Boston Collaborative on Food and Fitness, are really intrigued with the right to food and the way that it's been um, implemented in some developing countries, such as in Belo Horizonte in Brazil. And they're looking to those other uh, countries for inspiration. But are you seeing this in the United States at all? I'm not yet convinced that we're seeing <clears throat> uh, or hearing much of a discourse on that topic, on, on the right to food. I mean, we've used, we're using terms like food justice. We're using terms like food democracy. Uh, when I, when I, what I see at a local level typically are people wanting to get more, more of a handle on um, being able to maintain existing food systems or strengthen existing food systems so that more food can be sourced locally, trying to address sort of immediate food security and insecurity needs of, of, of various populations. There's a very kind of immediate focus. Uh, I, you know, the right to food still has a bit of a, I think, an international and even intellectual bent to it, and it has, I can't say that it's yet permeated the the uh, discourse at a local level where people seem to be very kind of focused on, on local action, local needs. Uh, how do we hold on to those uh, remaining farmers? How do we, how do we kind of maximize our, our, our local food system? Okay, yes, in front. Hi, um, I just wanted to start off actually uh, for Ms. Norbert Hodge. Uh, when I read Ancient Futures in 95, I think it actually started my process of thinking about a lot of these issues. It was a pretty amazing book. Um, the, a lot of the things that you guys are talking about have very common threads. And you know, we hear things about the effect of large business simplifying issues and creating bigger and more complex systems that essentially we can't control. And media does play a very important role in that because it shapes how we look at things and how people view it. And the common solution that everybody seems to point out is the kind of obvious one, we have to change incentives in order for people to behave, want to behave in the correct way. My question is, and this is a question of opinion, not fact, for all of you, what do you see as the practical, tangible way that you would expect incentives to shift in a system where media is more and more con conglomerated, those who determine the structure of things and those who also determine what fact is in terms of the way it's presented to the average populace are in fact those with the skewed incentives. Um, you know, if the average man thinks that Monsanto is a wonderful company because of this, this, and this, and while there may be 100,000 people um, on a smaller level saying why it's terrible, that's not the main message, right? That's not the network television, that's not the... What's the what is the actual pattern that you would imagine would evolve to where that can be dealt with? Well, I... Listen, both in the United States and Europe, we're living in democracies. We have the food policies we deserve, right? Uh, it's food policy, agricultural policy, subsidies are all set by elected politicians, right? If this was really important to the average person in Europe or in the United States, if this was something that was generally talked about during elections, if this was deemed as something that the average person really, really, really cared about, then we would not have the farming system and the farm subsidies we have today. We have the farm subsidies um, because we have very well organized farm interests on both sides of the Atlantic uh, that have direct access uh, to the central policymakers in Washington or Brussels or London or Paris or wherever it is, right? 
So farm policies are designed to satisfy a small, very small segment of society, generally large scale producing entities. And as long as that's the case, we're going to be in the system we're in, right? Uh, the, the farm subsidy system and the farm system will not change in either the United States and, and in Europe until there is much, much greater public demand for it. It won't just magically yeah. change itself. So the question then is how can you get that public demand? Uh, and there is, of course, no easy answer to that. If it was easy, it would already have been happening. Um, but Education, as many of, uh, have mentioned here already, is of course important. Um, how things are portrayed in media, how things are talked about in schools, local communities, and so forth. But again, we have the farm policies we deserve because there is not enough pressure either in the United States or in Europe for changing the system. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that if, you know, since I had a, a little bit of, a, of involvement in the farm bill this time around, um, you, you know, what typically happens in American politics is that you get a group of people who are louder and, and better organized than they were last time around, and they come and they ask for something, which is what the, you know, the advocates for a, a reformed uh, food system uh, advocated. You know, they, they came in and, and were trying to get basically more resources for local, sustainable, etc. They got a slightly bigger piece of the pie than they did last time, but it's still a sliver. And this is, what, this is what politicians do. They decide, how, do we di how big is this pie? How much can we divvy it up? And all these screaming alternative types over here on the margins are coming at us, and they want you know, their fruit and vegetable money. Well, you know, all right, we'll give them a little, big, little bit bigger piece of the pie than we did last time. You know, I, and I certainly came away uh, more cynical than I even sound. Um, <laughs> but I do think that those numbers are going to continue to grow. There's more of us than there are of them. And over time, we're going to win. But we're just going to have to be persistent and keep coming back and keep being louder and keep being angrier. We'll I, one, la one, one last question. Well, uh, can I also just comment on that? Because I think that there isn't enough energy and time and money invested in growing the numbers. In other words, the foundations that care about food and sustainability should be funding educational activities. And they generally don't. They tend to fund action. And I actually believe that if we invested a bit more of our time, not exclusively, into this information awareness sharing to build up the numbers, and I call that education as activism, education for action. And I keep seeing particularly when it comes to the local food community that there is very little effort put in there. So I think at every farmer's market there should be educational tools to get more people aware of the policy issues. So it's not just about shopping at the farmer's market. In my institute we develop what we call a local food toolkit which is designed to try to help people bring out that information. And I think there should be more things like that. Passing along the DVDs, passing along the information as one of the most important actions we can take. Great, so my name, my name is Noelle and I work for a program called Green Corps that trains young people how to do grassroots environmental organizing. And the number one issue behind climate change that everyone in the program cares about is food. But I just can't help but feel like uh, there's, the food movement isn't political enough and I was really excited to hear everything that you all said today. Um, and I guess this is mostly a question for Mark, but I'm wondering, um, like what, I'm just wondering more like what the ultimate strategy is gonna be for the, for the food movement, like what's gonna be the turning point um, because I know there's all these, it's a very multifaceted issue, like sh should we go after the schools first, should we go after the, like, s after agriculture first, I'm just wondering what your opinion is on that. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Have 30 seconds. <laughs> go after all of them, I mean, don't, don't leave any stone unturned. I mean, yes, how do we distribute our resources most effectively? I'm not sure I can come up with a good answer right now. I think the work you're doing with young people is incredibly important. Um, I do think that the um, expanding our, you know, that, that food has to, become, has to come back into our, our, our public school curricula. I mean, it's just absurd that we're, it's, it's been uh, kicked out and, and, and dismissed. I think it has to be reinvented in some way there. Um, 
I, uh, I think that actually I think we can we can probably learn a lot from uh, Great Britain in terms of what they've done with uh, at least from what I understand and and sort of rebuilding their their school uh, meal program and food education. And gardening, gardening, gardening too. Gardening every as I think as uh, Satir you mentioned gardens. We all have to garden. Get out there. I don't care where. You know, there's a nice piece of grass out there. Let's go out there at lunchtime and rip it up and plant something. Um, I do think that those, those very hand, hands-on activities change people's hearts and they change people's minds. I've seen it, you know, it, sound, it might sound a little trite, but I've seen it happen a, a million times. Um, <clears throat> I am in, in yeah, and the, politi the politicization of our work has to grow. I don't, we sometimes become a little too content with the notion that we're, uh, you know, really changing the world when we're planting a garden. It's a good start, but it's a start only. And it's a place where we have to build our political consciousness at the same time as we're, you know, cultivating that tomato plant. Uh, so I would look for those opportunities to try to do that. And I would challenge every statement that's made by in every action of the industrial food system. Uh, you know, it's, it's blatantly... Uh, uh, corrupt. Uh, 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 it's very persuasive, uh, but and it's very dangerous. And so I think we have to keep coming at it in in all in 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 every at every opportunity we have. I think we're going to be coming back to a number of these issues. I sense some embers in in the group and among us that it's going to be exciting. Although I would prefer that Mark not dig up the the uh, grass in front of my office, quite yet. <laughs> Though in fact, if you live in, central Ma in eastern Massachusetts, this is the key weekend for planting, which I have to do this weekend before I, I take off. So thank you to the panel and thank you to all of you.